people want to learn about deer hunting in California, they can come to my classes. We talk about how to put in for the draw. There's a lot of people that can pull the trigger on an animal, but they don't know what to do with it after. A lot of them walk right up on it before they even see it because they're so intently looking at the ground for blood that they get within five to 10 feet of it before they even see it. I don't know a game worn out there that is gonna give you a warning for having a loaded gun in a vehicle, regardless of whatever kind of story you have come up with about why that gun's loaded. I think we're losing a lot of those potential new hunters because they just give up or something else priority comes up in line. Private landowners are basically allowing us to get hunters to hunt their private land. We basically want to give the students some confidence that they can use to go out and do it on their own. This is Lieutenant Alan Gregory of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and you're listening to Living Country in the City. Y'all ready for your dose of flyover state spirit? Straight from the concrete jungle? Well, put down your latte and pull on your boots. It's time for Living Country in the City. Hey, y'all, we are coming up on it. The second to last episode of the season. I just want to wish y'all a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. I hope y'all are getting to spend this time with your loved ones, whether that's family, friends, or maybe just uh, enjoying some time alone at home with your dogs. But once again, Merry Christmas to y'all. Once again, thank y'all so much for tuning in week after week. And for many of y'all year after year, y'all make all the effort that goes into putting out this podcast week after week more than worth it. Also want to give a huge shout out to Sawyer Products for their continual support of the podcast. If y'all are looking for those really simple products that, you know, keep you in the outdoors for longer, stuff like first aid, water filtration, insect repellent, and sunscreen, make sure y'all check out Sawyer Products. You can find them at sawyer.com. They've been doing this for over 30 years. They're a household name for a reason, so give them all a visit. All right, y'all, without further ado, for today's episode, I'm taking it back to my California roots, and I am talking with Lieutenant Alan Gregory of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Among his other duties, Lieutenant Gregory is the one that runs the Advanced Hunter Training Program here in California. This is a really cool program that, honestly, I'd never even heard of until now, and it's awesome, especially for new hunters that really want to take it past those basics of your first hunter's ed course. But don't worry, this episode also contains a few little tidbits here and there that are applicable to hunters of any skill level whatsoever. So, hope you all enjoy this episode. Okay, y'all, welcome to episode 88 of Living Country in the City. I am here on the line with Lieutenant Alan Gregory of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, Lieutenant Gregory, thanks so much for hopping on. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. So, always like to start out with uh, just a little introduction maybe about yourself. How did you get your start in hunting in the outdoors? Yeah, so uh, I had kind of a atypical start in the hunting. Uh, I grew up in uh, Stockton, California. For uh, those of you who know Stockton, it gets kind of a bad rap, but uh, my mom was a single mom, and it uh, wasn't until I was 13 when she uh, married my stepdad and ultimately my my mentor into the hunting lifestyle. Uh, we started, uh, he was a member of one of the pay-to-play hunting clubs that have numerous properties all over the state, so started out by pheasant hunting and waterfowl hunting, uh, deer hunting on these properties all over the state. And that g- gave me the, uh, the drive and the uh, experiences uh, that when I got my driver's license, I took off on my own and, and started exploring our uh, public land uh, with my friends. Started putting in for deer hunt and that ultimately grew to a, uh, a deep love and respect for the outdoors and uh, and the resources that we have, particularly here in California. Uh, and that ultimately is what led me to uh, go to college for uh, to become a game warden. And here I am today, you know, 16, 17 years into my career with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that's, that's where I'm at. So you actually uh, went to went to college with the intention of becoming – uh, of working for CDFW. I did. Yeah, I uh, 
I, I can pinpoint it back to one day. I was hunting up in uh, the X-12 deer zone over in Mono County and uh, just walking down the road to get to a hunting area. And this green truck rolls up behind me and just happened to be a game warden. He did his uh, normal check, you know, hunting license and deer tag. And uh, we chatted. He gave me uh, some areas to go look at. Ultimately, it wasn't successful on that hunt, but what that did for me is it uh, it said, man, that's a cool career. <laughs> Dude gets to drive around in a in a state rig and uh, and talk to hunters all day long. So I can look back and say, so I was 17 at the time. I can look back and say, hey, talking to that guy is why I wanted to become a game one. And ultimately went to school for it and got my degree in wildlife management and you know, worked for the department as a scientific aide for about 18 months before I got hired, and the rest is history. <laughs> so did you ever uh, talk to that game warden again? You know what? I I, have, I haven't. Um, I've been asked a couple of times, uh, just from older game wardens who have now retired, uh, who was it, and nobody's been able to put a name to it. Uh, and all I can do is describe him. I can't. Uh, I, I never got his name, uh, so I really can't say. And no, I haven't talked to him. Oh, funny. It almost seems, though, like they should be able to pinpoint it down to, like, a, a handful of guys, at least. Like, if you knew kind of the – I mean, if you gave them the general uh, time and – or, I guess, dates and, and area, you'd think, you know, you would be like, oh, okay, well, you know, it would be one of these three or four guys or something, but – yeah, and, and you know, uh, now that I've been in this career for a while, I, I look at uh, where I was, when I was. So opening weekend of the X Zone deer season, uh, generally those are the the busier times uh, in those areas, and they and wardens from other parts of the state go over into those areas and work uh, just to help out the local wardens and. So it could have been the the district warden. It could have been somebody from San Francisco, for all I know. Um, it's, it's tough to say. Uh, but I, I will say we probably didn't keep that good of records about who was where, when, uh, <laughs> back in 1994. Well, that would be a – that's a shame. That would be cool if uh, you could go back because I'm sure he would love – I mean, I'm sure, absolutely sure he would love to hear, uh, you know – what just that one little inner pleasant interaction and, you know, him pointing out uh, those places and what uh, what the effect that had. And honestly, with what you're doing now, the effect, uh, that exponential effect it's having across the board, it's, it's funny the difference one person can make. I know it's kind of a cheesy thing to say, but (laughs) it's, it's really important to remember. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And I've tried to, uh, uh, encourage people who who want to be a game warden or have had the thought of being a game warden. It's probably one of the most common things that we hear, except for, hey, it's my first time, give me a break. That's probably <laughs> the most common thing we hear. But what it is, uh, it, you know, oh, man, I've always wanted to be a game warden. Or I was going to school to be a game warden. And, you know, my follow-up question is, why don't you? Um, yeah, I mean, the state has some age restrictions you know once you're getting up there in, in years but um i mean we we're, we're always looking to hire hire people that love the outdoors you don't necessarily have to be a hunter or fisherman it definitely helps in the job wanting to you know have that respect for the wildlife and understand what hunters are doing out there what they're going through out there uh, and it helps you be a better game warden all around, not just catch more poachers, but just be that steward for the resource that uh, that we're getting paid to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I haven't. I've yet to have any uh, any encounters with a game warden while I've been out so far. A um, couple times. I've been glad because I've realized about halfway through a trip that I left. Uh, left my my license in the car and only had my tag or <laughs> I, I will I will admit I have I've made a couple of those one year uh in Arizona or this last year in Arizona for 
the first couple of days, I, I will admit I had printed out my old license and not my new license. <laughs> um, so that's been, uh, there've been a couple of times, but yeah, no, I haven't, uh, I know, you know, guys always joke a little bit about like, Oh, you know, hope I don't run into the game warden, even though, you know, they're perfectly legal, but, um, absolutely. You know, I, I was going to say stories like yours are one of the, the benefits of actually, I'd say running into a game warden, um, because a lot of the time, you know, you sit up, you strike up a conversation. They, they may look at you and be like, "Oh yeah, you know, I saw some uh, saw some deer up on this ridge. There's a nice, you know, a nice four by four up there or something." You never know. Uh, you never know what inside information you're going to get. So I'd, I'd probably look forward to those encounters. You, you know, you're you're absolutely right. For for me, uh, now I'm going to preface this with I always kept some spots to myself <laughs> that I didn't tell people about, but and I'm sure most game wardens do. But for a for a district game warden uh, who works 250 days a year out in his district or her district, they they understand what the animals are doing. They understand where the animals are, when, and why. Uh, and it, it always surprises me when people don't ask. They don't say, hey, where should I go? Where, you know, what area should I hunt? Very few. I, I'd say it's a very low percentage of folks that actually ask for some, some advice. I mean, we kind of get thrown under the bus in California for not having uh, great deer hunting. But if you're willing to work for it, uh, there's there's some quality hunting to be had in the state, and that's evident by some of the deer and I mean pigs. We've got more pigs than we know what to do with bears. We've got more bears than we know what to do with. Um, people just need to get out and and, and work for them, and uh, and they'll be successful at some point. Oh yeah, well so that's um, I'm you know I'm actually uh, kind of curious of your opinion of some of this as you know someone working for the department of fish and wildlife you know we you you mentioned pig you mentioned we got more bears than we know what to do with you know and i know predator hunting is always a touchy subject with some people um what are your thoughts uh and feel free to tell me if this is something you're not supposed to comment on what are your thoughts about uh lion hunting here in uh here in california right right so you know, back in 89, 90, 91, I can't remember which year it was, you know, the the voters, the people of the state banned line hunting. Uh, now, uh, anybody who, you know, stayed awake during political science classes during high school know that we are a country for of the people for the people. So we, you know, when we voted, you know, as, as Californians uh, and Granted, I was uh, too young to vote then, so I, I didn't vote in that election. But the uh, we voted to to ban lion hunting. Uh, so, and when the people vote it, it's much harder to repeal it. So, what I can tell you is that in the years prior when we did hunt them, our, our the numbers that we killed weren't very high. Now, currently, we are. I, I don't have the numbers to be specific, but we, we take a lot of lions under primarily depredation uh, when when an animal has killed uh, domestic livestock or a family pet. Uh, we kill a, a lot of lions uh, every year under that those pretenses. There are some every year that are killed under public safety where they've threatened or are acting not consistent with their behavior, uh, you know, coming out during the day just hanging out in areas that they shouldn't be hanging out in. So are they a predator? Yeah. Are they taking their fair share of our, uh, of of deer? Yeah, they're doing their part, but I think it's just, it's one part of a greater issue that, that we have. And and I only speak to uh, my anecdotal uh, experiences. I'm not a biologist. I don't do surveys. uh, But what I can tell you is, is that there's there's a lot of factors that are coming into play. There's predation, primarily lions, and, and I'm speaking mainly to deer here. But uh, there are 
predation of fawns, primarily by bears uh, and coyotes. Uh, there's habitat quality is, is low in some areas. Um, vehicle collisions uh, take a lot of deer. Uh, poaching, there's, there's some aspect of that that's thrown in there. But, you know, what are the factors that we can do things about is what we have to look at. Uh, you know, we can't, we can't, unless the, we vote in, I think, a 66% majority uh, to, to uh, repeal that, that ban on lion hunting, there's, there's nothing we can do about that at the time. And, and ultimately, I don't think it would, it would do much uh, by hunting them anymore. Uh, we're just at that point where we, 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 we probably kill more under depredation than we do under, hunt, than we would under hunting them. Well, I think we're so, and I, I mean, I, I think there's somewhat the case with bear, uh, black bears too, is we're also so limited in how we can, we can hunt those animals. Uh, you know, it, it's all, uh, it's all one specific type at this point. There's no more running dogs. There's no more trapping or baiting, uh, for, for bear. Well, and of course not lions, but I think, uh, you know, when you limit it that much, it, it, it absolutely, you, you just can't make a, a dent in those populations to, to balance that part out after a certain point. Sure. And, and, you know, we're talking lions and bears, we're talking the, the apex, uh, predators, uh, that we have here in California. So, uh, granted bears, most of the time are not predating on deer. They're predating on deer when the fawns are dropping. But when we have a limited number of methods of take, uh, what we refer to them, uh, it, it definitely reduces the number of, of bears we could take a year. Uh, one way to look at it, though, is, is how do you... Um, so I say we have an, a, a lot of bears. We have more bears than we can deal with. Now, that's just a comment uh, that I... I've noticed an increase in the number of bears in my particular areas that I patrolled or I hunt in and then talking to other hunters, I see this. So it's just anecdotal data. Um, but how do we change anything? How do we say, Hey, there's so many more bears, but the number of bears that we kill every year, or we harvest every year is staying kind of consistent at that 1300 level somewhere in there. Uh, would, Allowing hounds back in uh, increase that? Sure, it would. It would bring us up to the quota. Uh, there's been some talk about removing the quota. Well, we only kill 1,300 bears a year with, with the quota, so mm -hmm. there's no there's no argument in favor of getting rid of the quota. Uh, you know, we allot 1,700 bears to be taken and reported a uh, year. We haven't hit that since uh, the ability to use hounds has was was removed so it, it would definitely if we had that additional method of take of uh, hounds it would it would get us up there uh, would it make a big difference in the grand scheme of things i i don't know bears are one of those species that are are difficult to count uh, that's why when we post the number of bears on our website it's a big range of, of animals we they're just a hard animal to quantify numbers for so, and then say, so are lions. Uh, people are up in arms about, we don't know how many numbers. Well, you're right. We, we, we're not sure. And that's why we give this big range. Uh, they're just difficult to track, difficult to count. They don't migrate down trails. They don't congregate on winter range areas. It's, it's just a different situation. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, the numbers up on the, uh, the California Fish and Game or Fish and Wildlife website. Um, what information does Fish and Wildlife uh, here in California report? Uh, like, what uh, what can the public uh, go out and access? What can they what can they learn from what y'all do? All right. So, if we want to talk about a specific species like bears, deer, what do we want to? I can I can kind of narrow it down because we offer a little bit of different. Sure, just yeah. just an idea of kind of what uh, you know, what information is is out there. If uh, you know, it's easier to pick a specific species. Just kind of a general idea of of, of what y'all do. Gotcha. So we we have you know on our website we provide 
you know, our maps of different zones, and uh, and then we provide spot kill maps, which are based on tag returns of where deer were killed, and, th- and that's what that shows us is a couple of things that a lot of hunters are hunting these particular areas. That's why there's consistently the number of, of deer taken in those areas. Uh, but it also says, wait, wait, there's probably a bunch of deer in there. That's why there's a bunch of hunters in there. And that's why there's a bunch of harvest coming out of those areas. So that's somewhere where like a hunter, a new hunter looking to hunt you know, anywhere or somebody looking to hunt a new area can go and say like, all right, well, I'm going to start here. Or if you want to get away from people and you, don't go to those areas that have all those <laughs> spot kills. Uh, and, and a lot of it depends on where you're hunting too. I mean, if you're hunting on the coast range for the blacktails, there are non-migratory deer until you get up there in the, uh, the old bullies or the King of the Alps, but pretty much everywhere South there's deer are there year round. Uh, the West slope of the Sierras migratory and resident deer herds. So depending on where you hunt or you have access to hunt, that can help you kind of narrow that down. Um, and then that's where kind of my program comes in is if people want to learn about deer hunting in California, they can come to my classes and we talk about how to put in for the draw, how to best use your preference points. A lot of people, it's surprising. A lot of people have no idea there's a big game draw. <laughs> uh, and, and then it comes down to using your points, gain, even gaining preference points. A lot of people don't know their preference points and what they're for and how to use them. So we, we do a lot of that. Uh, and we talk a lot about habitat and, and, and sign reading. Um, a lot of the places where I do my classes are, are specifically picked, particularly for deer, in areas where there's deer signs. So people can go out and compare a pig track versus a deer track. Or, uh, I mean, deer don't leave a ton of sign other than tracks and, and poo, right? It's, uh, we don't hunt them in the rut, so we're not looking for scrapes generally. We do find them when they're removed from when they remove their velvet. But, you know, that's, and then we talk about game care and game processing uh, in those classes as well. We'll actually gut a deer, either a poached deer or a, a decent roadkill deer. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll gut it. We'll, we'll, the students will gut it. I'll just supervise and say, cut here, cut there. And, uh, and that, that always seems to be the biggest takeaway. Uh, there's a lot of people that can pull the trigger on an animal, but they don't know what to do with it after. Uh, and so we, we skin it out. I was going to say, so why don't you, uh, let's talking about your program, why don't you uh, kind of introduce your program? This is, this is kind of why we initially connected was um, you, uh, you run the uh, Advanced Hunter Education Program for the California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, this really kind of speaks to me because you, you target folks like me who started hunting later in life, correct? I wouldn't necessarily say target, but that tends to be the students that register for the classes somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of my students are in that 25 to 45 year old age range. And very few juniors come to my classes, and then very few older hunters uh, over that 45 range come to my classes. So it is the what, what we in the hunter education field refer to as adult onset hunters, <laughs> people who started hunting as adults. So, um, what, you know, you, you talked a little bit about what some of the classes offer. What's the general elevator pitch for the the advanced hunter education program? How would you summarize the program? How would I summarize it? So I think on the, my, on the website, I talk about, uh, take it to the next level, come learn. Uh, Whereas in basic hunter ed, you learn safety, you learn conservation, you learn ethics, you learn a little bit of first aid, uh, firearms handling. Advanced hunter education takes it to the next step. It takes you to learning about specific species, deer, pig, turkeys, upland game, waterfowl, uh, or learning different skills like land navigation, marksmanship, game processing, uh, cooking, game cooking classes, we have wilderness first aid classes. 
So it's, it's basically taking your education to the next level uh, and, and leveling out that learning curve a little bit uh, for, for new hunters. So really, I mean, someone like me who was like, you know, I want to get into hunting. I, you know, I went out, I'm like, okay, well, I got to get my license. So I went and did that. I took the hunter ed courses and it's kind of, I'm like, okay, well, you know, I know I can get a tag and go out and shoot a deer in theory, but really I don't, I'm, I, I don't know what all that encompasses, what else I need to know surrounding that. Um, would you, you'd say this is kind of that that those cl- these classes fill in those those knowledge gaps for someone who kind of figured out the basics and wants to get started but doesn't really know the next steps to take yeah absolutely so if i can ask you a question i would say hey sam what got you into hunting what got you started well um i always i always laugh and uh initially say eva shockey um but, uh <laughs> <laughs> like like every every young man my age uh had a giant crush on her um but, uh honestly uh for me you know I've mentioned it I think once or twice before on the podcast it was it was kind of this series of events where I I got into shooting and then I took some some uh long range marksmanship courses and it got to the point for me that I always have to have a reason behind what I'm doing. There has to be, um, you know, if I'm working out, I need to either be learning a a sport or, or training for something. Um, so if I'm shooting, you know, punching papers all well and fun and and developing that skill is great, but I want to have a reason as to why I'm doing it. And so I started, uh, developing a bit of an interest in hunting and looking into it. And, uh, then, you know, I started following, more hunters online and um i saw a couple people shooting bows and and so that kind of started my interest into bow hunting so you know generally it was it was a development a step-by-step development but mostly it just came from uh wanting to do more and and you know find value have a value for what i was doing right so so you had you had some kind of reason and then ultimately some goal uh to, to reach. So what I see, and that's, that's kind of a, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's atypical of, of the students that I talk to, but it's, I've talked to students that have similar progressions like, like you did. A lot of them are, and my dad used to hunt, but when I got into high school, he, uh, you know, he didn't have time to take me or I had an uncle who hunted and he didn't, you know, I, I can never go with, um, uh, things like that. There's also the, uh, people who are getting into hunting for the organic free range meat. Uh, they're not opposed to taking a life as long as that animal is utilized, uh, for the health value in, in eating wild game. So we get this big gamut of, of, of folks that are new in the hunting, and they all have that question. It, it's really easy. What do I need to do to start hunting? They go to a gun store. They go to a sporting goods store. Oh, you need to take a hunter ed class. Okay. They go to our website, and they take a basic hunter ed class like you did. Uh, and then afterwards, they go, well, what do I do next? Uh, and depending on the instructor who taught the class, some instructors provide more guidance uh, during the class and for for hunters after that say, hey, you can apply for these uh, apprentice pheasant hunts. Uh, you get priority in these in these pheasant hunts, or uh, contact one of your uh, nonprofits like California Waterfowl Turkey Federation. Uh, they have programs for for new hunters. But if they don't, then they're left to be searching the website and forums and YouTube for videos on what to do next. And before you know it, I think we're losing a lot of those potential new hunters because they just kind of, after so long, you just give up or something else priority comes up in life. So what my classes offer is they offer a and it's a, not a one-stop shop by any means, but it's a, it fills in a lot of those 
what ifs, what do I do, how do I do it uh, areas for these new hunters. Tells them where they can go. Talks about different types of public lands between BLM or Forest Service, Department of Fish and Wildlife lands, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service lands. Uh, talk about methods of take, you know, firearms, rifles, muzzle loaders. Talk about regulations. You know, as you said, you know, you left your license in the truck. Yep, it happens. Uh, there's a lot of regulations when it comes to hunting, and not just California. You know, whether you believe California has more game regulations than other states, um, probably haven't been out of, out of state. <laughs> uh, other states have far, far more regulations than we do here in California. It might just be in a different format. But so we talk about regulations, and then we talk about the animals, the biology, the natural history of those animals. And that fills in some of those gaps, like where can I find deer? Where are they going to be? Uh, we talk about habits of the animal. Uh, we talk about the game care. What do you do when you harvest the animal? Uh, you know, the gutting. Uh, how often, uh, if you ask most hunters, they either were shown how to gut an animal by a relative or a friend, or they watched it on YouTube. And I hate to say it, but watching it on YouTube is no substitution for the real thing. As, I mean, you you clean an animal, right? You you harvested a buck in Arizona this year. Oh yeah. Um, there, it's it's an experience. And had you had you experienced that up to that point? I had not. I had I had seen a a white tail. Uh, very quickly uh, skinned and cleaned. I'd seen a couple of them done in Mississippi uh, a few years back. I didn't really participate other than to hold a bag or shift the the bucket. Um, right. And I'd, I'd done, like I said, I'd done a lot of watching on, you know, Elk 101 or on YouTube and done a lot of research. Um, but I think what you miss with that is so much of the nuance and and a lot of the important little tips and tricks about, you know, okay, you're gutting something and, you know, before you cut this, you make, you kind of want to make sure you squeeze up that, <laughs> squeeze all the, you know, what out of that intestine uh, to make sure it doesn't rupture all over your meat and make sure you don't nick this. And if you pull here, it's a lot easier to get to this spot. And right. that's stuff that saves you a ton of time, a ton of work. And it can often be the difference between some good tasting meat and something that tastes like, well, not so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. So, so doing that, seeing it done in person in a, in a learning environment where you can say, Hey, this is why you cut that connective tissue at this point. Uh, and, and like I said, the little tips and little tricks that I've learned over uh, how many years have I been hunting now? 28 years. Um, I've done it right. I've done it wrong. Uh, I've learned that there's, there's ways to do it that are much faster, efficient, cleaner, and it ultimately allows you to end up with a better product. You know, and I say product in, in meaning your, your meat, like you said. Uh, so in these classes, the students, if I could offer two things in my classes, it would be where can I hunt, and what do I do when I harvest something? That If I could offer just those two things, I could have a class every Saturday of the year and have it full. It's just I can't physically do that. <laughs> um, but that's what people are looking for is, is where do I go and what do I do when I harvest something? Because, you like you said, you watch videos or wa even watching somebody do it, that's better. But – Unless you're getting your hands in there, it's hard. Um, most people take their animals to the butcher, uh, and that's fine. I can tell you that butchers are very frustrated with the some of the pro, some of the animals that are brought in. <laughs> hair all over them. They're not cleaned. Uh, they're not properly skinned. And, and, and what the butchers are concerned with is is transference to other animals that are in their their locker. So. You know, helping helping these hunters do it right. 
So, you know, in addition to the gutting, we also skin. And we show a way that I've learned how to skin and that my fellow instructors uh, have learned how to skin to where you get the best product and ways to clean the carcass to uh, so it's, it's in the best condition possible when you do bring it to a butcher or you bring it home to cut it up yourself because you cut your own animal up, correct? Yep. I, uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, some really good buddies, uh, the guys over at Hunt 3A down in Arizona, and they've, uh, you know, there's some awesome guys who are just literally willing to, they'll be the first ones to take someone out and show them the ropes and show them what to do. And um, they've got a a very nice uh, prep surface and uh, a very good process and uh, Kathleen, my buddy Josh's wife is very anal retentive about getting every single hair off of every single piece of meat, which was fantastic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Absolutely. you know, there's something so satisfying about doing it yourself. Um, you know, knowing that pretty much, uh, you know, you and, and those who are helping you are, are the only hands to have ever touched that meat. You know, you know, I've heard, I know some butchers are better than others. I've heard I've heard horror stories about people not getting back their own meat or, you know, uh never being a hundred percent sure that what they're getting back is is all theirs and you know, you you know exactly how much fat's going in, you know uh one hundred percent sure that it was that it was taken apart cleanly and and properly and and I think, you know, you can get a lot more meat and a lot more cuts than necessary if you send it to a butcher. I've heard stories about so much meat getting left behind um, when you let someone else do it. Right. I just recently made a a fantastic neck roast uh, from a recipe, uh, a barbacoa recipe. Um, I took a, my, my deer's neck roast. We just literally chopped it off and, you know spine and esophagus and everything still in there because you know the neck there's so many nerves and everything in there it's hard to really turn it into anything but grind and uh you know so we just chopped the whole uh the whole neck from the deer with a big cleaver and vacuum sealed it and i threw it in a crock pot and made turned it into an awesome barbacoa and you know that's something i probably wouldn't have gotten back if i had sent it off to someone else to be processed. And there is such a huge satisfaction and joy in that knowing that, you know, start to finish I'd done that. And it wasn't, you know, I love grind too. Don't get me wrong. I, uh, I, I use the grind more than anything else, but, uh, you know, just knowing that something wasn't just, uh, going to be thrown in the grind pile, that there was something more I could do with it. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I probably hold my comments back on, on the processing, you know, like the butcher stuff, because it's a business. Um, I think what it is primarily why people say they get more meat, uh, when they cut it up themselves is that, uh, the butchers generally hang an age for a certain amount of time. And what people don't realize is that you tend to lose quite a bit of meat. When you do that, you get that dry layer on the outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, even, in, even in a, properly humidified uh, locker uh you still lose you lose meat due to that but what what you got to remember is that that this is a business and they're in the business of processing animals and they're probably not taking the time to you know slice off every little bit of meat off those you know that that roast where they're more just going at it Oh yeah, and they're good at it. I bet if they slowed down a little bit, they would get more meat off than you and I cutting up ourselves. However, that slowing down slows down business, and that's what you got to remember. Um, I I don't think there's a whole lot of meat theft going on. A lot of uh, a lot of people claim that butchers steal meat. Uh, I don't think so. Um, oh yeah, I don't think that's the they've case. They've got so much meat coming in that. I think they just want it out. <laughs> they don't. Uh, I'm pro- there's probably a bunch of butchers that are vegetarians. You know, <laughs> kind of like you do one thing every day, all day. You don't want to see a piece of meat when you get home. Uh, well, and it's just. I, I think it's. Go ahead, sorry. I was going to say I've heard stories that are almost the other way around. I've heard more stories uh, from friends that you know whose families have butcher shops where they're where they say it's like 
some people they just they send off a bunch of deer and they don't pick up it pick it up they you know yeah. we'll we'll message them a hundred times and it gets to the point where we tell them we're like okay this is gonna go this is going out of here this week one way or the other um right you know and it's it's funny so i imagine yeah i don't i don't necessarily think butcher shops are stealing stealing meat i've I've heard stories about them getting mixed up with other deer and things like that though for sure yeah i think uh some a lot of that comes to do with like like when you and i grind at home uh and this this probably all has to do with grind uh or sausage or some other form of, of processing other than just you know steaks and roasts mm-hmm. but uh we're we're dealing with a lot of people just have one of those KitchenAid grinders uh, or a smaller, you know, L and M grinder or something, um, and it's easier to clean that after you grind 15, 20 pounds. Well, for a butcher, they don't have these little grinders on their counters. They're mm-hmm. we're talking big commercial grinders that can do 40 pounds a minute or you know, whatever some crazy you know, amount of meat. And it's just not, again, it comes down to business and time. For them, it's not feasible to uh, do individual grinds. So they know how much meat you had. They do a 100-pound grind. Let's say they got doing a batch of sausage. Uh, they throw it all together. They mix it. They stuff it or pack it bulk. And, and you get your 15 pounds of meat back. Now, granted, it may not be your 15 pounds of meat <laughs> mixed with somebody else's. And, and I, would, I will tell you, that's what ultimately turned me off from taking animals to the butcher and got me into processing myself, is that I knew I was taking care of my animals properly. And after a few years of being a game warden and seeing, not to the fault of people, just to the lack of experience cleaning and, and caring for an animal the animals weren't taken care of as well as they could have been. So oh, yeah. I was like, I'm going to do it myself from now on. And that's when I took, took that into my own hands and bought a grinder and uh, a friend of mine bought a stuffer. And we just, every year we go at it and process our animals. And now I get to pass that on to people in my class. <laughs> there is definitely a whole lot to learn when it comes to, I mean, you know, we always talk about it where the pulling the trigger is the smallest part of the whole experience of hunting, you know, and even even everything up to that is only is is just a a portion, you know. We talk you know, we talk about the experience and the hunt and and stalking the animals and I mean that's that's a blast and that's um you know, that's a huge part of the hunt, but you know, people then also forget about everything that comes afterwards. And that is just as much, you know, we need to focus on our education for that, for that portion of the hunt, just as much as we do, uh, for everything leading up to it. So really quick on that note, uh, we're just going to pause for a second, hear a word from one of my partners. All right, y'all, we all know that it's possible to get into the back country and take that big buck or bull with a set of surplus store camo and a Walmart tent. But let's face it, quality gear can often make the difference between checking out early due to sheer misery and pushing through just a little bit further to find success. But all this gear can start to add up, and that's why I'd recommend shopping at Black Ovis. They carry high-performance hunting gear from all the top brands like Vortex, Crispy, Sitka, First Light, Mountain Ops, and Stone Glacier, often at a nicely discounted rate. I've yet to find anywhere that offers a more reasonable price, plus their shipping is free and their customer service is unmatched. Additionally, by making the choice to shop at Black Ovis, you're supporting a company that's involved in and gives back to the hunting community. It's where I do all my gear shopping, and whether you're just looking to replace a few items or build out a brand new kit, Black Ovis is the one-stop shop for super solid hunting gear. Additionally, you can help support Living Country in the City by doing all your gear shopping at Black Ovis. Visit livingcountryinthecity.com slash Black Ovis, bookmark the link, and use it whenever you do your shopping. All right, we are back. We were talking a little bit about uh, the classes that uh, you offer through uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And 
So you mentioned uh, some of the classes focus on the different different species. What what kind of species classes are offered? So so I offer uh, for single species pig, wild pig, uh, wild turkey, deer, and then species groups upland game and waterfowl are the the game species that I uh, do classes on. I, I don't do a bear class. Uh, I don't do a predator hunting class. Can't really get into the reasons why, but I, I, those those are the hunting classes that I offer, or the species classes that I offer. And so, say uh, let's let's use deer as an example. What um, what kind of specifics do you go through uh, in a in a your species class on deer? All right. So uh, initially, when everybody shows up, they're bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, uh, <laughs> and I always cover regulations first. And I try to make it entertaining because it, it, it can be a uh, tedious, kind of boring subject. But I, I like to throw in uh, stories that I have uh, from being a game board uh, about particular regulations and uh, make it as entertaining as I can. But I want the students to remember that we as game wardens don't want people to get in trouble. We don't, we, I mean, we like making cases, uh, but we want people to be law abiding too, because ultimately if hunters are law abiding, then we get, we don't have that bad press uh, that mm-hmm. hunting so often gets. So because 80% of, of people in as roughly 80% of uh, Californians, don't have an opinion either way about hunting, good, bad, or indifferent, right? They just, it could, they could go bad they, and against hunting, or they could stay in favor of hunting, or they just don't care what people do with their time. So we want to keep people either in favor or indifferent. Uh, we would like to have more people in favor of, of course, but uh, we got to be realistic. So regulations is always the first thing. Uh, then we get into, uh, Species, biology, and natural history. Uh, we talk about food habits, um, you know, just behavioral habits, um, you know, what they do, maybe a, a day in the life of a deer, right? Where, where are they going to go in the mornings, the evenings, you know, at nighttime? Uh, we'll get outside generally uh, and go look for deer sign, look for tracks, look for droppings. Try in some of my areas, we get to do some actual glassing. We just have that good of a uh, uh, property over in Santa Clara County. Uh, it's a department owned property that is a phenomenal program. Uh, the are in conjunction with a nonprofit group. We've done water development, and all the cattle have been taken off of the property. And you see this just amazing deer population. Uh, probably what it was similar to what it was 150 years ago before we got here and put our hands in the mix. <laughs> but uh, so we do that. And then uh, I hate to give my trade secrets away, but I think it's uh, cats out of the bag. So uh, we talk about the draw that and we spend a lot of time talking about the draw and uh, putting in for the draw, how to do it. Uh, we actually Either if we have uh, internet service, we'll actually like go through an application. Like I will sign into my profile and go all the way up to hitting submit without hitting submit uh, on my deer draw. So if they know how to do it. We talk about preference points. Talk about you know where you know how many points it may take to get a particular zone and what you but what you can do in the meantime. Uh, you know getting uh, the non, just the open general tags like an A zone, B zone, or some of the D zone. Uh, or, or my favorite, the AO tag. Wait. <laughs> you get your AO tag every year, guaranteed, right? But you get to hunt from the second Saturday in July, basically through the end of December with that AO tag. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, a lot of people use the AO tag as a, a reason to go scouting. You know, because you can go, you know, if you've got a rifle B zone tag, you get your AO tag and go hunt archery and you know whether or not you're going to hunt a particular area or there's deer in there. We also talk about, uh, 
you know, firearms. Uh, people are always going, what kind of rifle should I get? Well, that's a tough question, but we talk <laughs> about it. Uh, ammunition we talk about. Um, we've been doing uh, the non-lead re- uh, not research, not the term I'm looking for, but talking about non-lead ammunition. And uh, there's a, a hunter ed instructor who did a lot of research, uh, who now works for backcountry hunters and anglers, who comes to a lot of my big game classes and talks about non-lead ammunition and educates people on why it's it's good and its performance. Um, and then, but the fun part, like we talked about, is, is the game care. What I normally do is I don't tell people that I have a deer or a pig or some <laughs> other animal, depending on the class. And, and we go out and we just make, I make up some story. Yeah, we're going to go do a blood trailing exercise. And I try to make this realistic as I can blood trail with splatter and with drops and with cooling and uh, different things uh, at different levels, uh, not, you know, not just on the ground, but on mm-hmm. like, you know, foot and a half off the ground or on a bush where uh, a bleeding animal rubbed up against the bush. Um, I think that right there is probably one of the most, I mean, aside from, you know, like you said, actually prepping the game, I think blood trailing and, how how to track an animal, how long you need to be looking for something. I mean, that is so stinking important. That was one of the huge revelations for me. Um, you know, what it what it takes off times to to track an animal that didn't that didn't drop right away. Um, I think that's that's super cool. I think that's a really valuable uh, piece to have in the class because, some sometimes you are on hand you're on hands and knees just to get you to that next big splatter you're you're looking for one single drop on a leaf that may or may not have gotten turned over (laughs) right yeah and it's really important you know reminding people that say hey mark your last blood Mm -hmm. because you may get to a point where that animal is just dripping blood you know it's not squirting blood or uh and and you need to mark that last spot so you know where to come back to and go like okay take a deep breath now start doing concentric half circles in that direction and looking for broken twigs or bent grass or it's not just blood it's uh it's other factors that that come into play and because we we owe it to these animals right? We mm-hmm. put an arrow in that animal or put a bullet in that animal. We as law abiding ethical hunters, and I say law abiding because you have a legal responsibility as a hunter to not waste that game. Uh, and then an ethical hunter does what it takes to, to find that animal. And there are times when you just cannot find the animal. It's probably the worst thing uh, that, that can happen to you as a hunter. But want to provide that experience for these these students and ultimately at the end of that blood trail they find a deer or a pig and and a lot of them walk right up on it before they even see it because they're so intently looking at the ground for blood that they get within five to ten feet of it before they even see it and it's always entertaining because like did you just shoot this deer (laughs) <laughs> sometimes it's very obvious you didn't show the shot, you know, just shoot it. But sometimes I get good specimens and they're in good shape. And uh, I always like to tell a funny story as a, a couple of two years ago I was uh, headed down to Santa Clara County. Uh, I left my house at about four in the morning to a, go into a deer class. And about five minutes from my house, a big old buck jumped in front of my work truck oh. and I clobbered him. And it was a buck that I'd seen for a couple of years. He lived right in town. Um, just a really, he was all in velvet at the time, but just, you know, I knew which buck it was. And, you know, I felt terrible. Uh, aside from, you know, trashing my work truck, um, I had, luckily, I, I'm fortunate enough to be married to a, another game warden. And I limped my truck back home, threw all my stuff in my wife's truck, and, I had two deer in my truck already, 
but I stopped on the way out of town and, and grabbed that buck. So I had three deer and that one was, it was the best cause it was, I, I really just hit him in the head. So it didn't do a ton of damage to the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, uh, it was cool. Cause everybody was like, man, this thing's great. It's fresh. And you know, sometimes I can get a little stinky, you know, for being in the freezer for a while. <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, so we get to this animal, and then the question for me is always like, what do you do now? And the answer should be, well, you tag it. Yeah. <laughs> that should be the answer. The legal answer should be put your tag on it immediately, or at least fill out your tag uh, you know, as you're required to. Mm-hmm. Take some pictures, uh, high five your buddies, whatever you want to do, but then you got work to do. Right? you gotta, you got to skin and gut it, or gut and skin it. Wipe so, your eyes and get out the, the knife. Uh, that's right. So... You know, we we go right at it, and I basically guide the students through gutting the deer. And then I always I always like to drag for them to drag the deer back to kind of a, a staging area, just so they understand that this is not easy. Yeah, uh, you you may be able to drag a deer for you know a couple hundred yards, but you start getting two three miles back, you got to start thinking another option. You're mm-hmm. not going to be dragging that deer two or three miles. So I would like to, you know, the students don't really care for that, but after I explain why I had them do it, they, they understand. Uh, and then we string it up on a gambrel and uh, we skin it. And it's usually the last thing we do. Uh, so sometimes we have a little more time. Uh, and if we have more time, then we'll get to quartering and we'll, we'll quarter it as it's hanging on the gambrel. Um, and then a couple on a couple of occasions, I've got to where we've talked about boning the meat out, and that's kind of the just the basic process of a, of a big game class. Now, uh, pig is very similar uh, in the in the makeup of the class. Turkey is is similar. We do game care on the turkey classes too, uh, but we also we do calling and blind setup and things like that. Uh, waterfowl, we do a lot of calling uh, I, i'm i can't claim i'm a waterfowl guy i, I go <laughs> when i'm invited but that's about it uh, i can't call waterfowl <laughs> to save my life but i have i have instructors either uh volunteer hunter, ed, hunter education instructors or uh, i do a class with california waterfowl uh at their their property in solano county um and they have some really good instructors so you know, we, we basically want to give the students some confidence that they can use to go out and, and hunt and do it on their own, uh, that they don't have to rely on somebody else. I mean, granted, it's fun. It's fun to go out as a group, but sometimes you're going to have to do it by yourself. And we want them to have that confidence to go out and, and try it and, you know, not be, I don't want to say scared is kind of a uh, an extreme term, but. Some people are intimidated by the outdoors, and and this gives them some knowledge that they can maybe lessen that intimidation factor. Absolutely. So, what are some of the, you know, as as you go through these classes and just maybe with your uh, experience as a game warden, what are some of? Well, actually, I got two questions that relate to this. Maybe some of the biggest rookie mistakes you see people make, and somewhat related to that, maybe what are some of the biggest, I don't know, or most common violations you see people make um, as far as, you know, aside from people just willfully, you know, skirting the law, but it kind of uh, violations as far as mistakes people make, you know, that that kind of stuff unintentionally. Sure. Well, let's start with that one. So, um, you know, I had uh, the fortunate uh, opportunity to work uh, one of the West Slope districts, um, you know, the Sierras, where we had a lot of influence of uh, local people that hunted and fished and uh, a lot of people that came up from the valley. And so we had a very diverse uh, clientele, uh, and I'll use that term. Um, but one of the most common violations that we would see hunting, uh, aside from paperwork violations like not having your license in possession uh, or not having your deer tag, those are paperwork violations until you kill something without that in possession. Then it becomes something else. Mm-hmm. But 
the most common one is, is, is always loaded gun in a vehicle. Uh, and I don't know a game worn out there that is going to give you a warning for having a loaded gun in a vehicle, regardless of whatever kind of story that you have come up with about why that gun's loaded. That, that gun is, is the most important thing that you need to be concerned with, that the hunter needs to be concerned with in his day. So uh, it takes zero time at all to load that firearm. So there's no reason that, uh, you know, a hunter should have that gun loaded in the vehicle. Even if they're driving around road hunting, it, 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 they get out, they've got to get out of the car and get off of the road before they can discharge that firearm. So there's no reason to have that gun loaded in the vehicle. Um, I've, being in the program that I work now, uh, the unfortunate opportunity to uh, see the reports from what we call hunter casualties, and the vast majority of them are not not have nothing to do with being loaded guns in the vehicle. Some of them do, but just hunter judgment mistakes. So, and they're not that common, thankfully. Um, this hunting is still the probably one of the safest activities you can do in the outdoors. And I think that's a misconception. People think it's a lot more dangerous than it is, but per capita, uh, hunting is one of the safest outdoor sports you can do. Uh, so load a gun in the vehicle is probably across the board, the most common violation, whether it's just ignorance or intention. Um, we see it a lot. And, uh, and I can tell you in my experiences, the courts, because each county has its own courts, but they're all pretty consistent with loaded gun and a vehicle violations. They they are not they do not go easy on the uh, the suspect. So, but aside from that, uh, one of the most common things is uh, is not tagging deer. Uh, some people will shoot a deer opening day and they're like, "Well, my season's over. Well, I'm going to try and sneak this deer out of the woods, and then I'm going to come back and kill another one." So we call that a slick tag where you don't fill out the tag. Um, now that's a paperwork violation, but the intention was to get that deer out of the woods without using your tag. Mm-hmm. So that's, that would be considered a poaching violation. Um, spotlighting, depending on the area you work, people hunting at night with, uh, with artificial light is fairly common. Uh, some it's more common in some areas, but, uh, uh primarily areas with pigs, but that's, that's a relatively uh, prevalent violation. You know, most of the thing, I mean, the road hunting, some people think road hunting is illegal. No, road hunting is basically driving around looking for deer. Now, when you're road hunting, you're only seeing a very small portion of the forest or, you know, the, the sage country where you're hunting. So, and I'll just kind of segue into the, your other question, some of the, the mistakes that new hunters make is that they get comfortable with their vehicle and they do a lot of driving. Now, I just got back from Arizona on a a deer hunt with my son. We did a lot of driving, but it was driving to and from spots to do glassing for a coos deer. Mm -hmm. So I always encourage people to leave their vehicle behind, park it, and just start walking. Even if you walk a half a mile in a circle, just do a loop your chances of being successful go up exponentially. Uh, these deer get wise. Uh, they, they, nine months out of the year, 10 months out of the year, there's hardly anybody up there in the forest. And all of a sudden, one day in September, this massive cars comes up. And these deer, they go, well, something's not right. I'm, you know, I'm putting human thought, human emotions in, in deer. But their behavior is like, I'm going to, Slink back into the trees a little bit deeper <laughs> and that people need to get out of their vehicles and go but that 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 requires the confidence that you're going to be safe and you're going to be able to take care of yourself and if you do harvest something you're going to be able to know what to do with it and to be able to get it back to the truck so those are the mistakes i see <laughs> i'm always amazed when i um when i talk to people just about going out and hunting and, and, you know, what I love to do. And it just, I, you know, I forget 
how quickly I think we forget how disconnected people are from our wild places, like to an insane level because, you know, it's, I don't know. The, the questions I always get are so funny and it's not even, I understand why people are intimidated to get out in the outdoors because it's not even to the level of like, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do if I, you know, actually get an animal. How am I going to get out of all this? It's like, yeah, more experienced people often ask that, but so often I get stuff, just the basics, like, wait, you know, so do you take an inflatable mattress with you? You know, where my, my favorite to this day, my favorite is I'll tell people, I'll be like, you know, yeah, I'm spending seven days, you know, out in the wilderness and doing night hunting and, and people will be like, well, do you poop out there? (laughs) No, I, I super glue myself shut and, and, and come back a week later and, and sit on the toilet for a month. No, (laughs) yes, of course I do. Like, it's just funny how disconnected people are. And so I, I understand why people get so intimidated, but it just kind of makes me laugh. Um, how disconnected we are these days. They're thinking about the wrong stuff. Oh yeah. 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 They're thinking about the wrong stuff. You know, the disconnected part is, is also, you know, as, as our population grows, uh, and yeah, the number of people that, um, are disconnected increases the number of people that are connected, whether they hunt or not is also increasing. And, And we tend to be loving our wild places to death. I've heard that <laughs> saying somewhere, and I stole it from someone. I'm sure of it, but it's absolutely true. I mean, when I started uh, in high school hiking into our wilderness areas here in California, it was it was a, a rare thing uh, to see somebody in these wilderness areas. And now it's it's very common to be camping next to somebody. I mean, that's a kind of a side note to this whole conversation we're having, but there are a lot of people. And and we're having we have a lot of friends now in the wilderness areas where it's not as easy to get away from people as it used to be. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have both sides of it, and we're just the consumptive user side of it. <laughs> so, what uh, you know, I, I I travel to a lot of expos, and uh, you know, I go out of state a lot and talk with all kinds of different people. Um, and, you know, you tell people you're from California and you, I'm sure you've seen it too. You get that look or you get the, right. oh, kind of response. And, um, well, you know, you get, I, I've heard that, oh, you know, I heard camo was outlawed over there and oh, you can actually <laughs> hunt in California. Ha 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 ha. You know, <laughs> what's, uh, What's your what's your reaction when people are kind of like, oh, there's no hunting in California? Oh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I primarily hunt in Wyoming. I just hunt to Arizona was my first one. Uh, Wyoming is it's a great place to hunt. Uh, I think you do kind of get that California, you know, scowl uh, when they find out. But when a conversation leads to, you know, what we do in California, what we have opportunities in California, is it's just it's just on people not being educated. Um, and once you explain, like, look, yeah, we've got we deer hunt, we pig hunt, we bear hunt, we've got pretty much we've got elk, and we've got all three species of elk. Which ones <laughs> you have? I you love know, rubbing I mean, that in. I love rubbing that, that in. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, uh, I think it's just, and you know, I'll use the term ignorance in a, in a nice way is that they just don't know. They don't know what we have because so much of the stuff that gets outside of California is, is not conducive to their views or their values. So that's what they're judging Californians off of. Uh, I mean, we have a fantastic opportunity in California, uh, hunting wise. Uh, we've got fantastic Turkey hunting. We've got fantastic bear hunting. If you know how to hunt them. We've got all three subspecies of elk. We've got desert bighorn. Uh, we've got antelope. I mean, we have pretty much the earliest opportunity around if you want to hunt deer as well. 
Absolutely. Um, we've got fantastic waterfowl hunting. Um, I mean, you, you really can't go wrong hunting in California. So I, I just try to educate people when, when it comes down to that. And, and I think there's probably a, a very small minority of Californians that go out of state that give the rest of us a bad name. I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who a friend of his went to Idaho and was looking for some private property to hunt on and took his license plates off <laughs> <laughs> as he drove around from property to property. So they wouldn't see he was from California. Um, but I think the opposite would be true. If you go up there and you're uh, you know, asking to, to hunt private property uh, and you're respectful and you're just taking the effort to go up and talk to them, mm -hmm. uh, they respect that. You know, a lot of people walk up and in their camo, ready to ready to hunt, to ask for permission. Well, that doesn't go over well. Yeah, um, you're assuming you already have permission uh, to do that. So I always encourage people, to, you know, just go in your plain street clothes, uh, be very respectful. Um, you know, don't interrupt dinner. That's that's always a bad thing. You know, <laughs> go in the uh, early, you know, early afternoon, things like that. Uh, offer you know some help. You know, offer to go buck some hay or. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're out of state, you don't have that time to do that. But here in California, you do. Uh, you know, offer to fix fence, offer to cut wood, offer to back wood, anything like that. And you'd be surprised how some of these landowners uh, react to that. But uh, it's it's definitely we're we're on the tougher side here in California. So to for private property access, for sure. That's actually one thing uh, I'm looking at right now um you know i'm i'm up here in northern california now living with family uh, until i until i save up enough to get my own place and um i uh you know we've got a good amount of land here and you know we're on adjoining plots of land with family and so i've got permission to go uh hunt on a lot of those uh areas but you know, they're, they're button right up against the neighbors and there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, empty space that's not being utilized that I see those coyotes running on those turkeys running on, um, and all of that. And so I'm, I'm kind of at the point where I need to go, I need to go talk to the neighbors and I'm finding out way, uh, you know, I'm kind of getting the inside scoop and finding out what they might need. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'll be able to get that permission, but this is a, you know, this is a new experience for me. Um, because I focus mostly on, on public land, but, um, you know, there's something to be said for the convenience of being able to go out in the backyard, hop a fence and call in some coyotes or, uh, or chase that, that, uh, nice tall two point I've been seeing running around and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I've, I'm fortunate enough to, that I, met a lot of people in my career and, uh, you know, I've gotten permission to hunt private property, uh, friends that own, you know, their families own ranches and you're absolutely right. It, it's the hunting on private land is, is better is it, the animals are just more prevalent. They're less pressured. Um, and it, it's nice to have that. It, it really is. And, and, and I encourage you to keep, you know, working on those relationships with the neighbors and, and building up that rapport and, and, and showing these, these folks that hunters aren't all bad. Yes. There are like anything, there are bad apples, but, uh, for the most part it most hunters are, are good folks. There's no question about it. And most would, you know, give you the shirt off their back to, to help you out. Uh, absolutely. So, as we're kind of winding down here, um, where, uh, if people want to find these advanced hunter education classes, uh, how are these available? How often do they happen? Where can I find info about them? All of that good stuff. Sure. Uh, so, you know, if you go on, uh, on the computer and you just go to that, uh, wonderful website of Google and just type in advanced hunter education it'll be one of the first couple that come up uh that pop up and that'll take you to my web page on within the 
Department of Fish and Wildlife's webpage. Uh, and there'll be a, a list of available classes or upcoming classes. Like currently right now, I think I've got, got eight classes scheduled for 2019 so far, and I've got a bunch more slated once I confirm them. Uh, so they can go in there and, and there's no requirement for you to have even basic hunter education to come to these classes. Uh, some people call and they think that, and, and that, that's not true. You just, if you want to go, you have to, to sign up. Uh, I can tell you that the classes, once you get to the website and you say, oh, look, there's a, a, a wild pig hunting class next month down in LA. And I want to sign up for that. Wait, you mean there's actually hunting classes in Los Angeles? <gasps> there, there is absolutely hunting classes in Los Angeles, and at a club in the city of Compton, that is a phenomenal hunting and fishing club uh, <laughs> that most people would have no idea is there. So, let's see, I just got on the webpage, and for that class on January 26th, there are 32 seats available left over. That just opened for registration four days ago, and 28 seats have been filled, which is a little slower than I thought it would fill up. <laughs> the demand for these classes is, is very, very high. So we have a waiting list system. Uh, if you sign up, you, you, you sign up, and, and you'll get a confirmation email. Uh, you, then you just wait for the class, and you go to the class. The waiting list is, if the class fills up, the waiting list automatically starts, starts over and you register for the waiting list and you'll get an invite if a spot opens up. The, our, our registration system uh, will send you that automatically and say, hey, you have 13 hours to accept this invite or decline it or ignore it before it goes to somebody else. So... And what I find is that a lot, a lot of people just ignore it. Um, it's kind of frustrating because they're basically holding that spot for 13 hours that it could go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, we all, we all live with our smartphones now. Every time you get an email, it goes ting or make some other quack or whatever you have set up on your phone. And so I know people are getting these emails, but they're just not responding to them. Or they're responding to them, accepting or declining. Mostly people ignore it. So class of with 50 seats in it, I may get 100, 150 people on the waiting list for these classes. Uh, so I, I encourage people to register early. Uh, a lot of the classes uh, I'll open for registration about two, depending on the class, two to three months ahead of the class. And and it, but it'll say, when you click on the particular class, it'll say open for registration on May 1st yep. of 2019. I'm looking or right now. Whatever date. So you know. I'm looking right now at this wild turkey hunting clinic uh, yeah. here in Butte County. So I know what I'll be doing on uh, March uh, March 2nd. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at it right now. And it has the registration opens date, which looks like 10 days. I've got to wait to click this button. Is it 10 days, huh? Yeah, gosh. I gotta... So what I'll tell you what you'll get with that class is so we do that class at gray lodge wildlife area mm -hmm. that's butte county and gray lodge is infested with turkeys and there's special hunts for you to hunt to apply and get drawn for gray lodge uh, to to hunt um and that's another thing i should talk about too before we finish this today um but that class is taught completely by department personnel either so i'll be there uh, another game warden uh, will be there, and then uh, two other biologists will be there teaching that class. Everybody, all of us are turkey fanatics. So uh, it's a fantastic class uh, and a really cool place, and uh, so I encourage you to show up, definitely. Oh, I definitely but, uh, will be let's there. Let's talk about the special hunt. Yes. If we could talk about the special hunts real quick. So our department, not through the hunter education page, but through – uh, if you go to the hunting page, there is a hunting opportunities uh, spot on the right-hand side of the hunting page that talks about apprentice hunts or PLM, private land management hunts, the share hunts, or upland game wild bird hunts. 
this is where you're going to go to sign up for these turkey hunts on the state wildlife areas or uh, junior deer hunts on state ecological reserves uh, or the pen raised pheasant hunts for, you know, the apprentice hunts. And this is all in addition to like the big game draw for deer, elk, antelope, and sheep. These are just other hunting opportunities for, for people. So I, I encourage people to go there and apply for these hunts. There's a lot of opportunity. Um, a lot of people sign up for these apprentice hunts and then don't go. Uh, it's, it's kind of frustrating when talking with the, the, the people that put on the hunts, the, the wildlife areas or the, the hunt coordinators, and, and they may get a 50% show up rate on these hunts. Uh, so I encourage people to, to apply and, and go to those hunts and, and only apply for the hunts that they, they can conceivably make. Uh, a lot of people just kind of carpet bomb the hunts. It's not like applying for waterfowl uh, on the refuges. This is, this is specific to days and, and hunts. Um, so, but that, I, that special hunt program is, is pretty good. And the, and the SHARE program is the uh, Shared Habitat Alliance for recreational something I, I'm, I'm destroying. Recreational uh, acronym, enhancement. But enhancement. Thank you. <laughs> so that is where uh, private landowners are are basically allowing us to get hunters to hunt their private land. We cover their liability because that's in California. That's a big concern of, of landowners. So we we cover their liability on these hunts and. There's fantastic opportunities for elk hunts and turkey hunts and bear hunts and deer hunts on these private lands. And you have to pay $11, $11 per application, but the, the opportunities can be really, really good. So I encourage people to apply for those uh, the share hunts as well. Uh, the private land management stuff is a little bit different where uh, private landowners – uh, do habitat work to uh, help wildlife populations, and in turn, they can recoup their costs by charging hunters. Uh, in only a certain number, we we permit give them the number of permits that they can uh, sell mm -hmm. uh, to recoup their costs. So that's a little bit different. Uh, most most of us working folks, uh, it's kind of it can be out of our price range for some of the stuff, but. Uh, uh, it, it's a good opportunity because it does enhance habitat on private land. So uh, just wanted to give my two cents in the, our hunting program uh, so, there. So here's the big question. What's, what's my best opportunity other than putting in for bonus points for the next 15 years? What's, <laughs> what's my best opportunity to get a Thule elk hunt out here? All right. So, <laughs> so you, you, you'll probably reach through the phone here, but I've been drawn for Thule elk twice. Um, and I know some of you are going to think that, oh, I've got an in with the department and well, I got drawn once before I was work for the department. So anyway, um, and the rest the other time I got drawn on my preference point. So uh -huh. if you are not at max points, then you are vying for one of the random hunts. So there's two things you can do. You can apply for a hunt with one tag because then there is no tag given to preference points. Everybody has the same chance of getting drawn, whether you have zero points or 17 preference points or 16, whatever it is this year. Or you apply for a hunt with a lot of tags that give out more random tags. Generally with those hunts, you have a lot more applicants, so your odds tend to be lower. So if I were you, and do you want to shoot a bull or a cow? Um, I mean, you know, a bull would always be nice, but I will take, I would take any elk at this point. So a lot of times you don't have, <laughs> I am not a prideful man. <laughs> I would say, I mean, elk is the best thing going in, in this country right now. Uh, the elk populations are fantastic. Even in California, our populations are, are growing greatly. And, um, that's a whole nother topic for another day, but, the elk program has done a good job uh, with with our herds. So we've, we've got a lot of elk. Um, if you want to go shoot a 
cow elk somewhere in Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, they all have a bunch of hunts. So I would say since California is the only place you can kill a tule elk bull, I would say put in for a hunt, either an either sex hunt or a bull hunt. And your best odds of getting drawn are going to be the ones with the lowest number of applicants because you don't have max points. So putting in for something like La Panza down in the San Luis Obispo County, uh, they give out six tags per hunt period, six bull tags per hunt period. So you get one random tag out of that, but the, there's fewer total applicants. So your odds are a little bit better. Uh, putting in for Grizzly Island is fantastic. There's amazing bulls out there, but 2,000 people put in for one bull tag. So it's tough. Um, Cash Creek is a uh, pretty good opportunity, uh, but again, it's it's tough hunting. The PLM tags, or the, sorry, not the PLM, the share hunts. There's several Thule elk hunts on the share program and your odds are actually better on those than the general draw so i would put in for the general draw and the, all the share tuli elk hunts and eventually you're going to get picked for one but uh that's that's what i can say i mean it's tuli elk are tough man. <laughs> <laughs> not only are californians trying to get them everybody else in the country who has this grand idea of harvesting all 28 different species of big game animal, they need a tule elk. Good thing is most of those people can afford to get <laughs> a tule elk tag and pay for one through the PLM program. Yeah. Um, so for guys like you and I, we have to do it the old fashioned way and get drawn for it. So put in for the share hunts, put in for a, a hunt with either a quota of one or a low number of total applicants and that'll increase your odds. Good to know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know I could, I'm definitely considering my, uh, my draws for this year and figuring out exactly, exactly what I need to get done. Um, so, uh, like I said, as, as we're finishing up here, um, you know, I'm sure you encounter this a lot, but, uh, you know, and we've talked uh, probably a lot about it already, but if somebody came up to you and said, you know, Hey, I didn't grow up with a family that hunts. I don't, I don't really think I have the background or the experience to start hunting, but I'm interested in it. You know, what advice or words of wisdom would you give to that person? I'd tell them a couple of different things. I would say if you're interested in hunting, just start by taking the hunter education class. Uh, it'll do a couple of things. It'll, maybe answer some of these questions that you have about hunting uh, because it's not just hunter safety. It's hunter education. It's, it's not just handling firearms. It's talking about conservation and first aid and ethics and all that stuff. So that, that kind of, kind of fill in some of those you know, unknowns for people. Uh, and then two, obviously I'm going to promote my program. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say, Hey, if you want to learn how to deer hunt, come to my deer hunting class, you know, in, in April or May. And, you know, and, and I'll talk to them and say, you know, reach out to your nonprofits, reach out to California waterfowl or Turkey Federation. Uh, there's a lot of local chapters of these organizations and where you can start to network uh, with other people. And you'd be surprised uh, if people are members of these organizations, they tend to be more on the altruistic side and they may be willing to help you out and take you out. You know, I'm not a huge social media guy, so I know some people um, collaborate through Facebook and, and, you know, talk about going and hunting here and there. And, uh, but hunters are a weird breed. You know, you once you find a spot, you don't want to give it up. So, you're basically asking somebody to, to give up their, their spot. Um, and that's not an easy thing for people to do. So I would say educate yourself and then spend some time. I'm not saying do a seven day backpack hunt into the Trinity Alps wilderness. I'm saying go up into the national forest, you know, pitch a tent, 
spend the night, hike around. Uh, we all have smartphones that have GPS. Um, there's so few bad things that happen in the woods. Uh, you know, animal attacks, very rare. Biggest thing, cars break down and people panic and they don't know what to do. That's, that's the biggest thing. So take it easy, take it slow. Um, it may take you a couple of years to, to get that confidence and, and get the equipment. I mean, it's hunting is not a, a cheap investment to start. Uh, I mean, archery is very expensive. A decent rifle is, can be expensive. And then you've got binoculars and boots and pants. And before you know it, you've got a whole room dedicated to your hunting stuff. <laughs> and so take it slow. Um, reach out to people. Uh, and you'd be surprised what, what information you can find out. Um, volunteer with those NGOs, uh, those nonprofits. You know, do... You know, if you live down in Southern California where they put in guzzlers for, for wildlife, get involved with those groups. You're going to meet people that have similar interests. Uh, up here, Cal Deer offers, you know, they do habitat projects. Turkey Federation does habitat projects. There's a lot of opportunities. You just need to, to look for them and know where to look. I mean, everybody can go on YouTube and you know, search California deer hunting. That's not really going to show you a whole lot, but... There, the, the information is out there, and uh, you, know, you can always reach out to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, some of the regional offices, uh, if you're interested in going deer hunting in an area. Reach out to the, the – call the regional office in that particular uh, – that that unit is in, and ask, talk to the biologist, things like that. You, there's, there's information to be had. Uh, it may get frustrating in your search for it. But don't give up. Uh, I would stick stick with it because hunting, as you as you've come to find out, and I've watched you know, and, and listened to through your podcast, uh, your experiences make this. Uh, and people, I don't think they know what experiences they have the potential of having when they're out there. So uh, I just encourage them, and that's uh, that's what I do. I, I Tell people to get away from the roads and get alone. You just you start to have a different outlook on things when you're in that environment. It's definitely an incredible experience. Where even the worst hunts, I wouldn't wouldn't trade for much of anything on this earth. So, well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, hop on today. Uh, you know, I think everyone will really enjoy this one. So. Well, I hope so, and uh, they can find my information on our Department of Fish and Wildlife website under the Hender Education Program, and uh, shoot me an email if you have any questions, and I'll I'll gladly get back to you. Sounds good. I'll definitely make sure to link to those on the show notes page for this episode. Great. Thank you. All right, y'all, that'll do it for episode 88 of Living Country in the City. A big thank you to Lieutenant Gregory for taking time out of his day to hop on the line with me and share with y'all. Make sure y'all check out the show notes page at livingcountryinthecity.com slash 88. Get links to everything we talked about in today's episode. Also, make sure y'all take a moment and check out your own state. See if your local fish and game departments have any sort of similar programs. I think you'd be really surprised at uh, what's out there if you start looking. But hope you all have a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll talk to you all soon. But in the meantime, keep it country, y'all. Thank y'all for listening to Living Country in the City. Get show notes and check out the blog, product reviews, events, and more at livingcountryinthecity.com.